Good evening and welcome back to Mountain Minds Monday, a program of Tahoe Silicon Mountain. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Our gold sponsor, Holland and Hart, has been with us for a long time. Thank you, Dick. Glad to have you here with us tonight. Our silver sponsor, Mobo Law. Is anyone from Mobo Law here tonight? Not tonight, okay. And then so many community sponsors that help make this happen. So we have Nevada County Tech Connection, Truckee Tahoe, did I say that right? Tahoe Truckee, Tahoe Truckee Media, who's recording tonight, thank you. Um, the Truckee Tahoe Airport Lift Workspace, where we hold our monthly event, um, our Entrepreneurs Roundtable, first Friday at four. The town of Truckee, who supports some of our annual programs, um, the Startup Weekend, and our Pitch Showcase in the fall. And Tahoe Donner, who's good enough to have us here this evening, and what a wonderful meal it was. Thank you to Tahoe Donner. There's always room for more sponsors. If any of you are interested in becoming a, a sponsor of Tahoe Silicon Mountain, we do get a lot of views from our events after the fact on the YouTube channel, and we try to highlight that, as well as highlighting our sponsors on the <coughs> website. Thank you also to our individual sponsors. You can sign up and have sort of a fast track for signing in every month, so um, become an annual individual sponsor. So moving on to the main event. So excited to have a sellout crowd tonight. And I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Montana Hodges, who will introduce herself and the topic. Thank you. That's awesome. Do I need this microphone? Oh, no, you don't. I need to move that. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about mass extinctions and climate change. This is not the happiest topic. So. Um, Feel free, it's 50 minutes long and then the question, so it's about an hour, but feel free if you need to, to get up, go out, get a breath of fresh air, a glass of wine, and come back. It won't offend me at all. Um, I like to put a lot of art in uh, my presentation, so we've got a nice comic here about extinction. Um, a little bit about me. I have a PhD in paleontology. I'm your local paleontology and geology professor at Sierra College and Sierra Nevada College. Um, you can take my classes. We have very low enrollment because we're such a small community that we often tap our population really quickly. This is the first time we've offered geology every semester at our little local Sierra College campus. So please spread the word. Um, it's free for high schoolers if your kids would like to take it. Anyway, I specialize in reefal ecosystems through deep time, so I do a lot of work also with dinosaurs, which get all of the, all of the, the glitz and the glam, right? But we will also talk about reefal ecosystems because it turns out they're a little bit more important. You know. I like to do a refresh with my audience to see who I'm talking to today. I'm incredibly impressed by all your introductions. So this is probably a little simplified for you, but let's go through it anyway. So just yell out the answer if you know it. Archaeology versus paleontology. Does anyone know the difference? Good, yell it out. What is it? The study of man versus the study of fossils. Okay, yeah. Okay, so humans versus fossils. So archaeologist is which one? Man. Okay, yeah. All right, so we got mostly humans in there. About 50% of the time when I introduce myself to someone, they think I'm an archaeologist. And I blame these guys. <laughs> so you will know that they wear the exact same hat. <laughs> they have a very similar facial structure, and anthropologists, archaeologists could talk about it, right? So who do we have on the left? Indiana Jones. Indiana. Dr. Jones. Who do we have on the right? Dr. Horner. <laughs> okay, it was based off Horner, but in the movie it's Dr. Grant. Yeah, yeah. So on the left we have Indiana Jones, who's got a whip, and he's out there looking for artifacts, right? Human stuff. And on the right, we have Dr. Grant, who's back in dinosaur time. So I'm Dr. Grant in this, <laughs> despite what Hollywood has done. OK, so paleontology is the part of historical geology concerned with what we call prehistoric life. Now, there are times when this overlaps. Um, I was just working uh, for national parks over my winter break, and they were discussing a new site that we have in White Sands National Monument, which is a, a brand new monument that has human footprints 
from the last ice age and sloth footprints that overlap each other. So the human footprint will be on top of the sloth footprint and then the sloth footprint will be on top of the human footprint. So there are these places where we have archaeology and paleontology overlapping. But for the sake of our presentation today, we're looking at non-human stuff in really deep time. Okay, how old is Earth? 4.5 billion. I heard it in the front yard. I also heard old, which if you put it on an exam, I wouldn't take away all the credit. Because that's true. <laughs> Right? So 4.56 billion if we round up 4.6 billion years old. So really, really old. Okay, life on Earth. What is our oldest evidence of life? How long ago? We've got we've already established we have 4.6 billion. 2.8 million? Billion? Billion? 2.8 billion? Anyone else? 3 billion? 3.8? Okay, these are good numbers. Okay, approximately four. Now, it's actually whoever said 3.8 billion was totally correct. That is our oldest fossil, and it's of a stromatolite. We're actually going to have Kate, who didn't tell you, but she's also a geologist, pass around some stromatolites. The stromatolites going around the room are between 1.5 billion and 50 million years old. And what they are is they're sheets of like single celled slime. Think about really, really, really simple single celled slime dominated the ocean for billions of years. Our oldest actual fossil of it is 3.8 billion, but we have traces of what we would consider life would have to put that signature in the rocks back to four. Okay. The slime's the wiggles in it. So let's go back to this one. So you can kind of see the wiggles. Yeah, it's, it's, it's underwhelming. Just think of the billions of years. <laughs> this is why everyone studies dinosaurs, OK? I know. All right, so four billion years. And it's this, this simple single-celled slime that settled in mats. OK, how long have corals been building reefs? What do we think? There are different types of corals, like rugos and Scylarctinia, but don't worry about that. How long have they been building reefs? 600 million. 600 million is a really good guess because it's about 450 million. And that's just building reefs. The oldest corals are older than that, so that was a really good guess. Is the same kind of slime still around? Yes, it is still around. You can go to Sharks Bay, Australia and get heat stroke there like I did. <laughs> <laughs> you can still see it. Um, okay, dinosaurs. What was the span of the time of the dinosaur? How long were they around? How many, I'll give you a hint, millions of years? I, 300 million? Uh, 67. 67? These are all, actually, if you took the 300 and the 67, it's right in between. So 170 million years. But kind of, sort of. Because if you even go to Wikipedia now, it says Dinosauria goes from 300 million years ago to today. And that's because of birds. So this is a whole other presentation. If you ever want this one, I'll come back and talk about it. But birds made it. OK. What did Truckee look like during the time of the dinosaurs? This will be very important to our fossils. Ocean. Ocean. Flat? Underwater. underwater, yeah. So very, very good. At the beginning of the dinosaur time, it would have been like this. It would have been a fairly deep ocean. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for this. Um, tectonics mostly, paleogeography. We'll, we'll talk very little about it. But beginning of the Mesozoic era, which is the beginning of the time of dinosaurs, we would have had fairly deep water. Here's an ichthyosaur. Everyone knows your ichthyosaur, right? Like the IPA. Yeah, and then some ammonites. There's a plesiosaur in the background. Really cool stuff. Towards the end of the Mesozoic era, the very end of the dinosaurs, Truckee would have had volcanoes. Not the granite that we're looking at now, but these actual volcanoes spewing out lava. And the granite that we have now would have been miles deep down in the earth cooling. So it would have been cooling down, and that would later be uplifted. And then we would have a beach in what's the Central Valley, so the Great Valley of California. We would have this beach, and this is a really great picture. I love this one because this is exactly what it would look like at the end of the time of the dinosaurs, and this looks like a California state dinosaur. So raise your hand if you've heard California has a state dinosaur. <laughs> no. Okay, so this is, this is 
where are the press people? Okay, this, this should have been huge news. It should have been huge news. We got a California state dinosaur. His name's Augustinophilus Morrisi. He's really cute. He looks like this. And he was found in Fresno, which is the coolest thing to come from Fresno, right? And then we would have had plesiosaurs, like this big swimming dinosaur, uh, Mesozoic rep marine reptile back there, and turtles. So this is a nice snapshot of what the end of the dinosaurs would have looked like. Okay, we didn't have any anthropologists in here, did we? Okay, so how long have Homo sapiens, us? 40, actually, okay, so these are all really good because anthropologists argue this. Where does Homo <laughs> sapien begin? You know, like, where does it begin? So I'm going to say approximately 200,000. We're going to go in the middle of those two estimates. So approximately 200,000 years. Okay. I thought there would be a really small group. So with this exercise, only do it if you can. If you can or your neighbor will let you, stick out your arm. Anyone who has an opportunity to stick it out. <laughs> okay. So it needs to be out to your side, unfortunately. So you're all going to have to rock head together. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. This is how we make friends, right? Okay. So if from the center of your chest, from your center of your collarbone, right below your neck here, all the way to the tip of your middle finger was geologic time, we would think that single cell slime begins right where our arm starts, and then it's not all the way until we get to our middle finger in the geologic time scale that we start to get complex life. So all the way from here out to here, we have really simple, simple slime dominating the earth. When we get to the middle finger, our first little complex creatures start to come about. The middle part of your middle finger is the entire time of the dinosaurs. And then if you have a nice, trimmed, clean nail, <laughs> that's all of hominid evolution, and you're just the hairline, the homo sapiens, the hairline on the edge of your nail. So just to put it in perspective, because I'll put up a lot of geologic time scales, but they don't have the boxes represent the amount of time by their space. So it's all of this time. Finally, we get eyes and shells and stuff. Dinosaurs come and go. But the history of Earth is vast. Um, billions of years of life to study. OK, so there are all of these different branches of paleontology. We're just going to look at mass extinctions through geologic time. This is a geologic time scale by one of my favorite artists, Ray Troll. And this really puts it in perspective. Geologists like to read things from old to young. I actually had printed out some of these. I was going to pass them around the room so you could follow along. But there's so many of you. We're just going to do it together as a group. If we look at this bottom box here, it says Earth forms 4.6 billion years ago. And then the Cambrian is in the blue up there. So that's 87% of Earth's history is in this little box at the bottom. Um, from the Proterozoic, the Archean, and the Earth forming. So 87% of the history. And that's because we don't have a lot of life, as you see on the left-hand side. Life just starts to diversify and become complex in about the last 500 million years. So mass extinctions are events in which more than half of life um, on Earth rapidly goes extinct. So more than half of life. And what I mean by more than half is not more than half of the biomass, not the volume of life, but the type of life, the diversity of life. So you need more than half of life to go extinct. There have been five large mass extinctions that have eliminated at least 50%. It's usually closer to 90% of all of the types of life, of all of the biodiversity at that time. Six if you count today, but more on that later. The study of mass extinctions is a relatively new field. Um, there are significantly more of us now than there were 20 years ago um, because it's sparking interest. Um, but it's a relatively new field. Biodiversity is the measure. And it depends on how you're going to look at taxonomy, how you're going to look at genera, if we're going to look at family, if we're going to look at genus, if we're going to look at species. But you have to think about the types of life. And then when we use the word extinction, extinction is forever. So this will drive a biologist, a paleontologist, a mass extinction researcher crazy when you read panda bear 94% extinct. <laughs> that can't happen. They're either extinct or not extinct. They can be endangered. 
critically endangered, nearing extinction, but extinction is forever. So whenever we talk about anything going extinct, we're not talking about it ever re uh, having the chance to come back. Here we have a Columbian mammoth on the left and a mastodon on the right. These are some Ice Age critters that would have hung out in Truckee during the last Ice Age. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know where the closest mastodon was found to where we are right now? South Dakota, anything else? Boca Reservoir. Whoa. So we had a mastodon, if you're, I'm still sort of new here, but if you're, if you're coming from the dam <laughs> and you're driving towards Boca, some of the first turns that you can do to get down to the water, people back their boats in there, mm -hmm. you'll see some light colored cliffs and you can see some old lake levels. Boca's obviously man-made, but there used to be a glacial lake there. And that mastodon was pulled out of there. So yeah, these creatures were all around us. If you find anything, call me. <laughs> because there are battles as to whether or not Nevada gets to keep it or California. We're going to keep it in Truckee this time. OK? Uh, one of the major questions that we get a lot with mass extinction research is, aren't there gaps in the rock record? Yes, there are gaps in the rock record. There totally are. Um, but we can take that into account in modeling. This is, again, a whole other presentation on how we quantify the rock record and how we make sure that everything is continuous and how we actually know how much biodiversity is there. We can talk more about that later if you have questions, but it's definitely taken into consideration. There are always smaller extinction events, like the one that killed the Pleistocene megafauna. We know that our Ice Age creatures all died out, right? All the big stuff, except for pronghorns. They're like a weird hangover. <laughs> they're still hanging out. And you can tell they're really Pleistocene hangover, right? Um, so this extinction that caused the Pleistocene megafauna, the big organisms, to go extinct, that was not a mass extinction. That's a smaller extinction. They occur all the time, especially in the background. And we're able to tell when it's background extinction. So if you had your geologic time scales, <laughs> we would be looking at these five mass extinctions. Geologists like to talk about everything from oldest to youngest. So remember at the bottom of this chart, we have the Precambrian, which has 87% of life, life's history. And then when we move up there to where the mass extinctions start in these red boxes, we're only talking about the last 500 or so million years of the history of Earth. I'm going to walk you through each of these extinctions now, and I just want you to keep in the back of your mind what are the known supported causes for these mass extinctions? OK. So what causes a mass extinction? Anyone have ideas right now? Meteor. Oh, yeah, very good. That's the number one we get. An impact? impact? Asteroid or meteor, comet, yeah. Climate change. Climate change. Volcanoes. Volcanoes, atmospheric gases, climate change. Awesome. OK, so normally people just stop at asteroid. <laughs> It has to be an impact, right? <laughs> but, OK, so let's go back. This is Earth 443 million years ago. This is the end Ordovician. Notice here that we have a supercontinent. This is a supercontinent from before Pangaea. There have actually been other supercontinents. We just only talk about Pangaea um, in, in popular culture. But, so this supercontinent moved over the South Pole. What happens to land mass when it moves over a pole? It gets cold. It has the ability to glaciate, right? OK, so this is an 86% species loss. And it would have looked something like this. Um, um, most of life was still in the ocean, so there's not really a big hit on land. But what you had was climate change from this glaciation from the um, continent moving over the South Pole, which caused a major sea level change, which caused changes in CO2. And um, most of the marine life was really heavily hit, 86% of the species. OK, so let's move on. Now we're 359 million years ago. And this is the late Devonian mass extinction. We're headed towards the Pangaea that we'll talk about later at this point. So here we have um, a pretty heavy marine impact. Um, invertebrates and fish. Now we finally have fishes out there, right? Plant diversity greatly decreased. What caused this? OK, so Siberian uh, volcanism. Now, when I say volcanoes and volcanism in this measure, we're not talking about 10 or 15 volcanoes or even something the size of Truckee exploding. We're talking about rips in the Earth's crust that are the size of countries and continents. 
I'll put up a graph later that shows you what those lava fields would have looked like. So you have a rip in the Earth's crust that's so huge, it's putting out all of these volatiles into the atmosphere. You had major climate change. You had a cooling followed by a warming, changes in atmospheric CO2, widespread deep ocean anoxia. So that means that the ocean lost its oxygen. And then, as the sea level lowered and then rose, it drug the anoxic waters up into the more shallow zones. So it was a pretty bad one, but only a 75% species loss. <laughs> so we have to look on the bright side every chance we get in this presentation. <laughs> so this was a good one, good for them. Okay, now let's talk about the worst. Doesn't even involve the dinosaurs. No dinosaurs, they're not on the scene yet. This is the end Permian mass extinction. This is 252 million years ago, 96% species loss. This is called the great dying. Okay, so what happened? We had these really cool plants called glossopterids that built forests all across Earth. Really, really, they were on what would later be every continent. Um, they're completely gone after this time. Most of the insects that were around, um, for the tetrapods, for things that had four legs, the amphibians and the mammal-like reptiles were really heavily hit. We have a lot of Permian reptiles that sometimes people think are dinosaurs, and they end up in kids' dinosaur kits, and it drives us <laughs> crazy inside Target. As paleontologists, we can't go down the kids' aisle. But those all go extinct. Those all go extinct. Um, and then with marine life, the invertebrates are heavily hit, so the things without bones as well. Half of all the fish families, and all of the graptolites and trilobites. Now the trilobites are going around the room right now. Keep a, keep a spe pay special attention to the trilobites, and if they've made their way around, you can pass them back forward, because we're gonna talk about them a bit more. Okay, so was there an impact, right? This is the great dying. Was there an impact? No, there's no evidence for an impact. It's proposed every now and then, but there's nothing that really correlates it to this event. Um, climate change, definitely. Massive sea level changes. Again, we had volcanic activity. This time it would be where Siberia is now. Big rip in the Earth's crust, huge. Um, massive CO2 increase. An ocean acidification crisis which we'll talk more about later. And then again, we have this deep ocean anoxia. I have a question. Yeah. So mm -hmm. are, do they feel like the volcanic activity is what caused the it's climate change? putting or? out the atmospheric CO2, the methane, all these volatiles, yeah. So it can, it's, a, it's a combination of several things I mean, at each of these yeah, events. Are there any other things that would have caused Tectonics, the yeah, tectonics as well. Level. Exactly, the sea level changes especially can happen with tectonics. Mm -hmm. Um, at this point, that's a really good um, thing to point out is we are not worried about, you know, melting ice caps. So it's, it's happening in other ways, but the atmospheric CO2 that comes out from the volcanism is really significant. And this is a snapshot of some of those critters that go extinct during the Great Dying. And the trilobites are going around the room. Here I have the trilobites on the left. They're these um, marine arthropods with three lobes. They're really, really incredibly cool creatures. They dominated the oceans for hundreds of millions of years. They have the first eyes that we know of in the fossil record. They're really neat and they are never seen again. This is it, their time is up. Um, I talked a little bit about some of the Permian reptiles that went extinct, like you can see in the upper left there. You might notice a little guy kind of on top of one of those dead ones. That's a little hint at the rise of the dinosaurs to come. Then we had these glossopterids, these, these really cool trees that I love to talk about because back in the time of Darwin and later Wegener and the first geologists to start to um, propose continental drift, which would become plate tectonics, were tracing the fossils of these trees continent to continent and noticing that these things built massive forests and never did again. And you could match the fossils, so maybe the continents were all together once. We also had some pretty remarkable creatures like these sharks with little corkscrew jaws. Neat stuff. Okay, so let's move into the end Triassic mass extinction. 200 million years ago, Pangaea has formed and now it's starting to break apart, which for your question up front is going to cause massive sea level change. The breaking apart of Pangaea um, is going to cause quite a bit of sea level change. 
Uh, 200 million years ago, 80% species lost. So what's our hit list here? So a lot of plants, a lot of gymnosperms. Again, tetrapods are really, really heavily affected, but you know who walks through this extinction? Is the dinosaurs. This is smack dab in the middle of dinosaur time. Um, a lot of marine organisms were really, really affected by this. Your classic reef critters, the classic critters that build reefs. Um, most of that was because of the volcanic outgassing, the increase in the CO2, and we know we had a calcification crisis again in the ocean. So these marine invertebrate creatures can't build their shells. You may have heard about this with like the organ sea, uh, seed oysters or uh, what's the latest one, Dungeness crabs. A lot of critters are not able to make their shells um, today because of the changes in the ocean. And then we had the sea level changes, this time associated with the breakup of Pangaea. 80% species <coughs> lost. This is an artist's recreation of the volcanic outgassing. It doesn't show you at this point quite how massive it was, but it gives you a good idea. So you could think about a rip in the Earth's crust that's going to occur that becomes so big it builds the Atlantic Ocean. That's what we're talking about. And here's some ichthyosaurs having a bad day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, dinosaurs, finally, the one that you've probably heard of. The end Cretaceous mass extinction. It is 65 million years ago. It's another one of those not so bad ones, 76% species loss. Oh, it, if we look at Paleo Earth here, this is really, really fun to look at because you can see how much sea level rose. Pangaea broke apart and you can see the continents are flooded. Take a look at North America there and you can see that the inland sea in the center of North America, that's why we have all these really cool marine reptiles found in those states. Pretty neat. Okay, so what died? Okay, most plants, and a great way to think about it when it comes to tetrapods, um, things walking around on land, anything that was over 50 pounds and lived on the surface of Earth on the land dies. And so that includes all of the dinosaurs that don't become birds. It's a little sticky at that part. Um, ammonites, which are going around the room, these big coiled nautiloids, they rank really popular in public interest. People really like to look at ammonites and they're always at rock shops and stuff. If you ever find an ammonite, which you can find ammonites in Carson City, um, you can find ammonites just outside of Reno. If you ever find an ammonite, you're in dinosaur time or older. So pick up that ammonite and you can know, okay, I'm at least as old as the dinosaurs right now. Okay, what happened? An impact. <laughs> we finally got it. It's the last extinction, but we got an asteroid impact. We also had climate change that was occurring way well before that, and something called the Deccan Traps, volcanic activity, where basically what is now all of India was one giant lava field. And this had already been going on for a long time until that asteroid hit. Um, but we do know the asteroid hit. This is the one where you can actually say, oh, the impact hypothesis, and you can back it up with a layer of extraterrestrial dust all around the world. You can find this iridium layer. And we recently found the crater. And um, geologists had been hunting for it for a long time, but it turns out most of it is under the water in the Yucatan Peninsula, so it was forgivable we couldn't find it. <laughs> so now we know, now we know there was an impact. It corresponds with a lot of things dying. The asteroid killed the rest of the dinosaurs that aren't birds. You know, so we know that this, this correlation exists and it's very well supported. But what I like to bring up, and this is, don't worry about this, this is a, a diagram just showing some, some simple, um, simple planktonic critters from the ocean. But what we would talk about as mass extinction researchers is that biodiversity of this mass extinction, what was going on, it doesn't necessarily correlate exactly to the asteroid impact and the time thereafter. So the recipe was already brewing for the mass extinction and the asteroid was the last really bad day. <laughs> but if kids ask you, yeah, the asteroid killed the dinosaurs. It did, <laughs> definitely did. Okay, so let's talk about the future. Have we set the stage for the sixth mass extinction? 
If we look at long-term averages of extinction rates, and I would like to go back four billion years, but for the sake of tonight, we're just going to look at somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 in most of these. So let's go back 100,000 years, which we'll call our distant past. Our long-term average extinction rate, if we look at that, our current extinction rate, what is going on now, is up to 1,000 times higher than the rate in the fossil record. And this would indicate we're moving at a mass extinction rate, actually faster than any of these other mass extinction rates. Because these other mass extinctions that I've talked about occurred over one to two million years, and we're talking about one to 200 years in this slide. And you can see, we were, we were nice. We gave it 100,000, you know? Okay, so the future, and the future projections could be as much as 10 times higher than current extinction rates. If you're interested in extinction rates and biodiversity, I recommend the Center for Biological Diversity to start your research on this. So here's our Earth today. This could be a few years old. Maybe we have to update the ice caps. But is this what we're looking at? Are we looking at an end Holocene? That's the time we're in now, mass extinction. And what percent species loss would we have if we were representing it here? Let's talk first about where <coughs> biodiversity is on Earth. So most of the varieties of life on Earth occur in two different landscapes. So we have less than 2% of the surface of the earth is a tropical rainforest, but it's home to about 50% of all of the varieties, all of the types of life. <clears throat> what is going on in the Amazon rainforest right now? Burn. Why is it burning? It was lit on fire on purpose, okay? Wow, okay, that's happening. The reefs, less than 1% of the ocean floor is a coral reef, right? Uh, but it's home to more than 25% of marine life. Not to mention that 25% of marine life fuels the rest of the ocean, right? There are very few things that can survive without the reefs intact. So we're just looking at these two um, ecosystems and we're talking about a really huge part of biodiversity, the types of life that are around us. If you look at the decline in biodiversity, and a good place to start your literature review, I recommend Center for Biological Diver Di Biodiversity, um, you would look at it about everything you can look at if we're gonna put them in a big general group, like a freshwater species, a marine species, a terrestrial species, or if we put it in vertebrate, um, invertebrate, you know, we look at stuff like that, you're gonna have about a 50% loss since the years 1950 to 1970 and today. And th that's, really amazing. It's much higher for big things, what we call the megafauna. Um, and there are, you know, I get a lot of questions about species that aren't discovered and such, and those tend to be pretty small stuff like insects. Um, but it's, it's really a good thing to look at is birds and uh, big stuff. There's something that correlates with the rate of extinction. <laughs> and uh, I know, right? Okay, human population. Unfortunately, I really like this chart, actually. I like this chart a lot because I always put up a chart in my class, uh, especially my natural resources class, where we have human population going up and biodiversity going down, and they just, they just juxtapose each other. But if we flip it over and we make the extinction rate um, up high, so we, here we can get the actual curve of human population matching with the curve of um, our extinction rate there's something else that matches the human population curve really well. Yeah, carbon emissions. And there's all different ways to play with this. Um, I like this one a lot. So we have carbon emissions here in black. We have the human population in blue. And you'll notice as humans make more humans, the carbon emissions continue to go up as well. Um, a lot of people will talk about um, CO2 levels in the past and, and how much higher it's been on Earth, and it has been much, much higher, much higher. Um, but the rate of change never changed like this. So you don't really give life an opportunity to um, evolve, expand, die off, rebuild um, with the rate of change we have today. I really like this. So if we're looking at our atmosphere, who remembers when it was um, 
scary that we were going to go to 400 parts per million of CO2. <laughs> Do you remember all the headlines? Like, oh no, is it really going to happen? And this is what, last year? 415.26 parts per million CO2. It's kind of hard to see on this because it does look a bit like it's the edge of the frame of the picture, but this is the CO2 spike after the Industrial Revolution. It's because we went back 10,000 years, and if we had our human population curve in 10,000 years, it would exponentially rise like that as well. So that's, that's a, a steep increase. That is a rate of change that you don't see in deep time. So increasing carbon dioxide obviously leads to warming temperatures. We can look at carbon dioxide through time. So let's just look at it for you know, a little over 600,000 years here. Again, it looks like it's the end of the graph, but that is the spike up to 2015. Similarly, we can look at the um, average global climate uh, um, uh, temperatures, average global temperatures, and they also rise. So they're rising on the right here. Uh, the word, the term global warming, has been replaced mostly with the term climate change, which is fine, but the Earth is in a warming trend. What happens is the higher latitudes feel it the most. And because human populations tend to live closer to the equator, we don't have as much of an impact as the high latitudes um, on a day-to-day -day basis for our warming. Okay, so what's the biggest sink for CO2? The ocean. Thank goodness we have an ocean or we'd be like Venus. Our ocean's amazing. It sucks up that excess CO2 from the atmosphere. But when the CO2 goes into the ocean, it creates a carbonic acid and it, it creates what we call ocean acidification, which just means a decrease in the pH. It doesn't mean that the ocean turns to acid and you can't swim in it, which is a really common um, misconception. Th same thing with like acid rain. It doesn't mean you can't stand in it. It just means the pH is lower. It doesn't really affect us when we hang out in it, but if you're making your shell um, out of the ocean, it could, it could influence your ability to make your shell as an organism. This is kind of a confusing chart, but I'll walk you through it. So here we have atmospheric CO2 in red. We have the absorption of CO2 in the ocean and the black curve going up. And then the blue going down is the pH. So the pH is lowering at a rate consistent with the CO2 being put up in the atmosphere and sinking into the ocean. Nice NOAA chart. Okay, this is why we look at corals instead of dinosaurs, even though we don't get as much publicity. Okay, coral reefs are possibly the perfect proxy to look at mass extinctions. Here we have an incredibly healthy, beautiful coral reef. Absolutely gorgeous. You can see it has different colors. The color on the reef here is saying that the reef is alive. Corals are finicky. They have this symbiotic algae that they need. Um, especially reef ecosystem corals, makes these colors. Coral reefs are the first to go. They're like the alarm. They're the fire alarm to get out of the building. At every mass extinction boundary they, they were able to visit. They're the, the fire alarm for the extinction. And they're also the last to rebuild out of everything. So that's why they're such a great proxy to try and figure out what could it mean today. And corals are finicky, like I, talk, like I was talking about. And it's, it's really important to note that they're animals. Corals are little animals. So the, the little pull-ups that pop out, those aren't plants. Those are actual animals. And they're kind of these perfect animals where they can live forever if their conditions are, are um, suitable for them. So they have this really long lifespan, like a bristlecone pine, but even longer, right? So they're, they're finicky. They like to be in a certain um, part of the photic zone. They like a certain amount of light. They don't like their sea level to change. They don't like their pH to change. The thing they're most sensitive to is warming water, though. They do not like the water to change temperature. This is a hard to read chart, but bear with me also. These little blocks that look like bricks show coral reefs building. And then the big black dots show the coral reef die off. And we're in millions of years here. So you, and 
corals couldn't really hang out at the first extinction because life was just sort of coming about. They didn't have a good opportunity yet. That was our glaciation event back at the beginning. But every other extinction that they had a chance to be at, they're building reefs. They get to what we call a reefal optimum. They're super diverse. There's all these different kinds of complex corals, and then they die off. And it usually takes them millions of years to ever come back. So we can think of coral reefs kind of like a keystone species, but we're talking about a keystone landscape, right? Um, they're incredible keystones to biodiversity, and they've been indicators for every mass extinction that they were able to be at. Um, they have an amazing record of the most similar mass extinction to what we have today, the end Triassic mass extinction, um, in Nevada. And that's what we'll look at really briefly here. Also, corals fossilize well. So, you know, this isn't going to work if we're looking at how worms are doing or anything like that. There's some diverse corals going around the room right now. So you can see what a super diverse, complex coral looks like. Okay, so back to the end Triassic mass extinction. Remember, this is smack dab in the middle of dino time, but it's more species loss than dino time. And this is the one that's most similar to our events today. And remember, no catastrophic event. No rock from space. Earth made its own recipe over a much longer period of time. And the recipe was sea level change because of the breakup of Pangaea at this point. Volcanic outgassing. Now we can look at this diagram. If you see the big red splotches on Pangaea there, that's the size of the outgassing I'm talking about. That's lava. So that's how much lava it took for their CO2 spike, okay? So that's what I'm talking about. And the one in the middle there, um, it's really small print for you, but it says Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. That one's going to break apart and become the Atlantic Ocean. That's the one that's happening at this time. We get a major increase in CO2. We know that we have high ocean acidification. We have, a, um, actually, with the ocean acidification, a major calcification crisis. Organisms can't make their shells in the ocean. We have global climate change. And reefs totally collapse. So does this sound familiar? Does the recipe sound familiar? I know the time span is not the same because it's over such a longer period, but it's, it's a familiar recipe. So what can we learn from our own backyard? This is New York Canyon, Nevada. Has anyone been there? South of Hawthorne. A lot of people like to ride ATVs out there. Sometimes you get fossil hunters. It's legal to go out here and collect fossils. You can find beautiful ammonites. If you ever want to go, I'll take you out there. It's pretty cool. You also have to help me do research. But. Yeah, so this is a really, really great picture. Here we are in what would have been the shore of the west coast of North America during the dinosaur time, right in the middle. And there would have been a sort of a reef and a seashore. And then looking out to the west, where the mountains are now, would have been the deep ocean. There's also a ghost town. I didn't know if anyone had maybe been out to the ghost town to take pictures or such. OK. So here I have some field assistants. This is the most complete record of their most similar mass extinction to our recipe today in the world. It's a continuous depositional section, which is a fancy way of geologists saying there's no time lost. And it's like we took pictures moment by moment before the extinction, during, and after. So what we have here is the most continuous section. Politically, we lost to Germany and Austria for the boundary, but that was all politics. <laughs> they have the type section in the world. But it was historic. But this is the best snapshot you could ever get of this mass extinction, and it happens to be where reefs grow. So this is a very, very incredible site. So what did the rocks have to say? We went out there. We went into the Triassic, which is before the extinction. We looked for reefs there. We went to the boundary, and then we went past the boundary into the post-extinction. And we tried to decide what we could learn from the rocks. This is a fancy biodiversity chart just showing the complexity of corals. These corals that are going around right now, you'll notice they have, they're colonial. Each one of the little circles there, a, a critter lived in, a polyp would live there. Um, they're they're big, big, beautiful, branching, reef-building corals. 
And if you see at this, this turn right here in the graph, this is an extinction and this is the diversity and complexity of coral. There's the extinction boundary and here's them growing back. And this is over millions of years. So we had a, what we call the reef optimum, the great time of reefs. And then we know that at the TJ boundary, at the time of the mass extinction, we would have had decimated coral reefs worldwide. And so we went out, um, this, is my, this was my dissertation research, actually that's my, my prior professor, uh, George Stanley, he's a world most mass extinction researcher. And he was dead sent against me doing this site. He wanted me to work in Oregon, but I wanted to work here. Mm -hmm. So we went out to the Triassic and there are so many reef fossils, so many corals before the extinction boundary that we actually got this truck stuck on a giant boulder that was a rich fossil coral. And it's hard to tell from where you're sitting, but there's a finger in the upper left-hand corner and it's pointing to all of these little thin lines. Those are branching corals. So they're, it's so rich in reef full fossils, you really can't walk around without hitting one. We also found part of an ichthyosaur eroding out here. So really, really cool. Rich in reefs, they're everywhere. This is before the extinction boundary there. Then we go to the boundary. Here are my field assistant, Amelia. She's taking a measurement at the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, and it's just gorgeous. Really beautiful place to do field work. And then we go post-extinction after the boundary. We don't see reefs. We still see critters, though. This is really important. There was still life there. There weren't these ichthyosaurs falling out of hills and these reefal fossils so big that the cars are getting stuck on them. Um, we'd find like a little bivalve or an ammonite or a gastropod, a snail there. So we'd find these little things. Amazing ammonites. This is Amelia for scale and that's just the center of a part of one. So they would have been much bigger than that. So big, beautiful ammonites. Remember, ammonites are dinosaur time, at least as old as dinosaurs. And we weren't supposed to find this because it wasn't in the literature. But it turns out that we did find post-extinction corals. We found corals after the boundary. So we found the first corals, we didn't mean to, the first corals in North America um, that represent our, um, our side of Pangaea and the first corals that appear after this extinction. And that was huge news at the time. So we published the first appearance of post-extinction corals in North America. So here we have it, we have found the first part of our part of Pangaea, our side, um, the first things that made it after that extinction in our most similar event. And I call them the corals that shouldn't be there. Now notice this is just one little coral here, this one circle, as opposed to those complex ones going around the room. Oh, thank you. And so we're gonna pass around some corals right now that are these really simple, solitary corals, the first things to appear after the extinction. How long do you think it took for us in time to start seeing the first appearance of corals again after that extinction boundary? A couple million? Couple million? <laughs> Hundred million, I like that one. <laughs> um, so these are eight million and we're going, whoa, eight million years after the extinction event and there is a solitary coral living by itself in mud? Oh my goodness, you know, we're so excited. That's how coral recovery works. And they were these really simple, solitary corals, not these complex, beautiful ones that all live together in harmony, making these colonial um, structures. These guys are living alone. They're just one pull up at a time. They're living alone and they were actually living in really deep mud and they probably weren't even in the photic zone. So they were probably actually hiding out maybe in a refugia. They were in sort of a mud. There are corals that, that are like this in Java now. Um, and they were being smothered. And then so they, since they can live forever, they just start to regrow a different direction as they start getting smothered. And then we found out that they're all new species. So it became even more confusing because we're not really sure what to relate them to yet um, because we only have them down to a family scale. So is it good news? <laughs> Is it good news what these corals had to teach us? And this is where I say, I hope you have your beer <laughs> because it's gonna get rough. Well, it depends on whether or not you are a coral or a human. 
So the corals, they made it. Um, just this little tiny button right here, that's it. No reefs in the world, they're not building reefs. All we have are little tiny solitary buttons, little, little corals living by themselves, smothered in mud, probably in uh, hiding from the sun um, for millions of years. And it will take them millions more to start building reefs. So let's look at reefs today. I'm not going to go through all of this because I'm sure you're all aware that reefs are not doing well. These are just popular press headlines from fairly recently. Who's heard of coral bleaching? Probably everyone, right? Coral bleaching. When corals are put under stress, they can bleach. It doesn't mean they're dead yet, but they can continue um, this relationship of sort of starving themselves if they're symbiotic algae and then completely die. And that happens if their stress isn't removed when they bleach. The number one reason why we have corals bleaching is because of heated water. The water is too warm. So if the water doesn't then cool, they'll continue to um, starve themselves. And they essentially starve themselves to death. So that's coral bleaching. If we look at reefs at risk, it's everything, really. <laughs> There's a few spots. This is kind of like glaciers that grow versus glaciers that melt. Most reefs are under stress. Most of them are under stress. Some of them are under severe stress, and some of them are under moderate stress, and some of them are uh, predictable to be stressed. So we know that these events are happening mostly because of heating water and that it's rapidly increasing. The rate of the rate, the, th the whole theme of this, it's the rate of increase. Um, I'm gonna jump back to 2012. This is called the International Coral Reef Symposia. It's a time where all of us coral reef researchers get together every four years. It's mostly modern, modern reef researchers and marine biologists and everyone famous you ever saw on TV, and then there's a few of us paleo people in there with them. But it was all the way back in 2012 that they signed a consensus, these thousands of scientists signed a consensus that the Great Barrier Reef was bleached to a point of no return. A barrier reef means it's a big giant platform like the size of a continent. So it's the size of the Australian continent being built out in the ocean. Doesn't mean all the corals will die, but that that we call it the lar largest living thing on earth because you could think of the reef as all being one living thing, right? That largest living thing on earth, it was all the way back in 2012 that they were already saying goodbye to it. We actually meet this year, we met in 2016 and we meet again in Germany this summer. If you have any questions about what's going on in the barrier reef, if it can be saved, um, why corals are bleaching, what it's like all over the world, digital homework, my students' favorite, Go watch Chasing Coral. Has anyone seen this? This is amazing. It's on Netflix. It's an hour and 15 minutes long. Uh, really, really, really good documentary. And I think it's very well done. And it will take you to the proper resources. It'll take you to all the famous characters and all the famous literature you need to understand what's going on with modern corals. So easy to watch. So what about the future? We've decided to quote those um, those in the more modern marine biology world than me, that the barrier reef, the way that they say it in Chasing Coral is, is, is sort of beautiful and tragic, but they say it should mean something, losing the barrier reef. They never say, we're gonna, we're gonna save the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. They say it should mean something. Maybe losing that will wake us up for something else, you know? That's the way that they put it. So what about the future? I get this question all the time, you know, oh, I heard in 10 years we're going to be in a mass extinction. It's like, man, 10 years ago I heard we were in it. <laughs> so human population, here we are in deeper time. So we're going back here 10,000 years. That is what our population curve looks like. When I was a kid, I, I remember when my dad would tell me that the population was going to level out at 5 billion people. Okay, and then when I was a college student, it was seven billion, and now I'm the professor, and I'm like, guys, your textbook says 10.5, like 10.5 billion. That's going to be our carrying capacity, you know. So we just keep bumping this number up and modifying everything to feed us around us, right? 
Extinction rates over time match these population curves, right? Here we're looking at mammals, birds, um, vertebrates, just everything else with bones, right? Fish, and then we have our background extinction, which we can isolate. This is a great quote. It's very accurate. So think about human population like this. It took 200,000 years for humans to reach 3 billion in number. It took 40 years for the next 3 billion. That is how we grow. We are really good at making more people. <laughs> so we have a future of people. According to my textbook, 10.5 will be the number. I can't <laughs> wait for my students to be teaching and what the number will be, right? Um, and it's the rate of the increase. It's not that there's so many people. It's not that there's so much CO2. It's not that the water is too warm. It's the rate of increase that doesn't give biodiversity a chance to grow with it, <coughs> die with it, evolve with it. Um, and reefs and rainforests, the two keystone landscapes for biodiversity, are being hurt at a rate that is unprecedented. The asteroid, maybe, but like I said, when that asteroid hit, it was already not a good day. <laughs> The biodiversity collapse is already in motion. So if you ask a mass extinction researcher, um, is there going to be a sixth extinction? And they're going to say, you mean the extermination event that we're in? <laughs> like, it's already happening. We don't question it. We don't question it at all. All we do is look at biodiversity rates, and we use our definition of a mass extinction. The question is not, will it happen to us? The question is, will you see it? Will you notice it? This, again, to go back to Indiana and Grant, this idea of a false apocalypse that you have to have Kevin Costner or the ocean over Chucky or something like that to mean that there's um, a mass extinction going on, this is where it all goes wrong. It is not going to be water world in a human lifespan. That's not how the Earth process works, right? So that's a, a false apocalypse. It should never have to look like this for there to be a mass extinction. And that's much to the dismay of burners. I know. <laughs> They're ready, but it's not going to happen. Unfortunately, it won't look like that. This is what it'll look like, right? Three million people a week move to megacities. That's directly from my natural resources textbook that I teach out of. Three million people a week move to a megacity. They move to a big city. We alter landscapes. I got to fly over Reno recently and have a look from the air and just look at the sprawl. So I mean, it's not that these people are going to look out their window and notice that the diversity of things is changing, right? Not in a short period of time like that. We're, we're, we're short-lived organisms. If you live in San Francisco, are you going to notice that there is a biodiversity crisis, that there is a mass extinction going on, that half of the types of things on Earth are gone? Will you notice it? Probably not. You're probably not going to. And, and that's where the false apocalypse comes in. You don't have to look out your window and have a yellow sky. You don't have to look out your window and see the sea rolling in like an a impossible movie, right? It's not how a mass extinction works. You might see a lot of pigeons. Pigeons are doing fantastic. I went to a really great talk by Dr. Jeremy Jackson, actually, at a coral reef symposium in 2016. He talked about the biomass of pigeons. Man, pigeons are doing fantastic. They're like humans, right? They're really good at making more pigeons. And where do they live? Cities. Cities. They love um, freeways and overpasses, and they just love it. So they're doing great, right? So we're going to see a lot of pigeons. But the problem is the people who do see it on the front lines tend to not live in the societies creating a lot of these emissions, right? And at this point, this is an environmental justice issue. So the people who rely on the resources and the biodiversity that is being depleted at unprecedented rates happen to be the people with the least amount of control over it. So if you live in southern Vietnam and you're experiencing flooding and your government doesn't have the infrastructure funding to keep holding back the ocean from flooding your farms, right? If you're in a community where you live off of the organisms in the reefs, um, if you are a person who lives on the side of a rainforest, these are the people who are being affected by it and you're not going to see them unless you put yourself in a situation for education on that. So 
I know nobody got up to get a beer, but you really needed it. <clears throat> that was my warning. But I'm a mass extinction researcher, so I have to find a way to be able to talk about this, right? So let's just consider it as scientists and not as emotional humans, which is very, very hard. I think of it as a call out to all future paleontologists, okay? We, for the first time, get to document the mass extinction from the other side of it. It's more so, Ben, everything disappeared in the record, and now we can go, let's watch it disappear. So we can actually look at this in a way where we can start recording it and questioning it. And I don't know if the awareness will ever be there. I don't have the solutions, only the information. Um, but we have, in a situation where we are geographically right here, the ability to look at our closest proxy, to keep measuring it, which I would love to continue to do, to keep researching it, to find out what we can learn for it, and then to apply it to what we have today. Um, you know, the average species longevity for macro fauna like us, you know, one to two million years, so we're probably not going to see reefs rebuild, um, but we can watch them, we can watch them now and we can record what's happening, and I think it's very important not to look for the false apocalypse view out your window as it's happening, to be aware of it. I think of it as mass extinction frontline reporting. We're like battlefield journalists, geologists. So if there's anyone in here who hasn't decided on your career yet, I think you should join mass extinction research. Um, and reefs are the best thing to look at right now. They're our trigger. It says the alarm has been sound. Is it correct? Reefs just can't take it. Um, in my classes, especially in paleontology and oceanography, I get a lot of questions about bioengineering. I heard that you can plant corals and they're going to rebuild and, you know, I, I, get, I get all these things and can you plant corals? Yes, but they're not trees and this isn't a forest. It's not, you can't rebuild a barrier reef. You can't bioengineer a carbonate platform the size of a continent. You might be able to put out some more hardy pseudo corals that look pretty to snorkel over at Club Med, but a true reef, by the definition of a reefal researcher, is not something that can be bioengineered. And it wouldn't matter if it could because you're going to continue to change pH and ocean temperature, so you'll just start killing off those guys. So the face of mass extinction isn't this apocalyptic view. It's selection, right? It's what we've selected for. There's a heck of a lot of cows, right? That's why the Amazon's burning, because um, they wanted to make room for more cattle ranching, right? And dandelions and cockroaches and jellyfish make it through every mass extinction. They, I don't trust them. <laughs> They're going to be fine. <laughs> They're going to be so fine. And just to make everyone feel better, there's still puppies because we like dogs. So I do dog rescue and there's an extra in my backyard right now if anybody wants one. So there's, I mean, the face of extinction isn't the face of Mad Max. It isn't nothingness. It's less everything. It's less stuff. And think of it like this. Remember dinosaurs? Do you remember? OK. They will rise again. This is really happening. So class dinosauria eggs like coming together, taking over the world. So at least we can give it back to them. So that is all I have for you. Thank you. I think we only have time for like two questions. I'll <laughs> hang out with you all later. We'll do one on one QA and look at the rocks together. So how many species how many species died during your talk tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a hundred a day. So let's see. Two hundred. Uh, I say, oh so it's gone up. Yeah. <laughs> My book's outdated. <laughs> that happens. Yeah, so hundred, two hundred a day, twenty four hours. So did ten. So I was curious about um, if an intelligent species lived like a billion years ago, how would we know? Okay. Yeah. Um, in the fossil, well, um, intelligent species, so we we're talking about prokaryotes and eukaryotes and the different type of multicellular life. We don't see any multicellular life at all until 500 million years ago. So I don't think that there would have been an opportunity for anything besides single-celled slime really to build. So I'm going to ask everyone to give a round of applause to our speaker, Dr.
and we look forward to seeing all of you at Mountain Minds Monday next month, second Monday of the month, right here at the Alder Creek Adventure Center. Thank you. Thank you.